Hello and welcome to the e-learning class around fiber optics. My name is Anas Larsen. Fiber optic cable is a very important component in doing modern analytical spectroscopy online, especially when using near-infrared spectroscopy. These fibers can bring light from a spectrometer to the process and back again they may be single fibers, they may be bundles. There's a whole bunch of physics that we have to be aware of in order to deploy spectroscopy in a very good way. Transporting light in a fiber optic is not trivial. There is so much physics going on. There are so many things that can go wrong. And we all want to understand the limitations to why can't we go this far with this region and so forth. In this class intended for slightly nerdy uses, I'll try to come around all the relevant physics working with fiber optic cables when doing industrial spectroscopy. Basically, we can use fiber optics for a bunch of regions, be that UV, VIS, mid-infrared, near-infrared, these are the common regions. I will generally focus on NIR fibers in this class, as that's sort of what we use at Kuhn's line. But in general, it's all about transporting light and the physics will be all around, uh, mainly the same thing. Quite often when we apply spectroscopy, it's all about having a process. So in the process, which we could denominate as a tank, we want to know what goes on. That could be in a pipe as well. We want to have transportation of light from a spectrometer to a given measuring cell or measuring point. And we want to transport that light back to some sort of a spectrometer unit. The distance here may range from half a meter in mid-infrared to 500 meters in the near-infrared. But unfortunately, when transporting light uh, to and from such, uh, such measuring points, there might be a lot of things that can go wrong. We denominate that with a lightning. All these obstacles and things we'll dig a bit more into, trying to understand how the fibers work, and in this way, will be much better dressed to use them in real world. Let's first look at the um, graphics here showing where we're working. Um, we all know that the UV has, the, the light in the UV region will have shorter wavelength, but higher energy. And the further down we come, the longer the wavelength and the lower the energy. These are the kind of things we'll have to battle in the fiber optics to transport, be that UV, VIS, uh, near-infrared or mid-infrared. But enough said about that. Let's dig into uh, a few of the uh, common things that we will see when we look at the package of fibers. In the first graphics here, we see that we can construct the fibers in two different ways. Three different ways, to be honest. It's all a matter about how much core and how much cladding. These are two words associated with the way we construct the fiber. I will get back to that in more details. But for now, the darker blue is the cladding and the white here is the core. If we have a fairly thin cladding and a large core, we call that a step index fiber. Those are the fibers we're going to talk much more about today. We also do have a balance between grading and core. We call them graded index. And finally, we have the single mode fibers where the core is very small and the cladding very big. These are basically for telecom. So these are, the, this is the first word. What kind of a index fiber do we have? From now on, we'll look at the step index fibers. But how is a fiber actually produced? Well, it starts with a glass rod, a silica glass rod. It, 
maybe like two feet, one meter long and an inch or a little above that in, in thickness. Then we will take this rod and we'll put it in a chamber and we will use the plasma outside deposition technology in order to dope into the outer layers of this glass rod certain atoms. Quite often we will fill this with fluorine and these fluorines when we heat the glass will sink in to the glass. So if we look sideways we will have the fluorines being doped, embedded into the glass from the outside. That's the first step. We have a refractive index of 1.44 of traditional silica. And by doping fluorine into the outer layer, we will lower the refractive index to 1.42 with some decimals at a given temperature at a given wavelength. But generally we start out with a rod and we dope in atoms. Now to produce the fiber we will heat the fiber and we will pull as the glass melts we will pull out fibers. Sometimes kilometers of fibers down to a few microns from this one. When we look at this fiber, it will be very fragile. Telecom fibers being seven, eight, nine microns, whereas analytical fibers will typically be two, three, four, five hundred microns altogether, of which typically 10 to 20 percent of the diameter will be cladding, depending on the production mode and the applicability. So now that we have this fiber, it's drawn. It will be very, very fragile. So what we do, as we can see on the graph here, we have the core, we have the cladding, and we put on a jacket. A, um, it, it's generally a, a plastic uh, jacket, which is deposited and gives it a lot of tensile strength. And we can actually roll it up. Whereas if we didn't have that jacket, uh, it would be very fragile and simply break. The next thing that happens is that we want to understand how to transport light in a fiber. Well, first of all, we have to say, can we get all the light through? No, we may not be able to do so. As can be seen on the graphics here, we have um, an incident ray denominated by an eye. Some of that light will be reflected off the surface of entrance. Some of it will be absorbed along the road of the fiber and some of it will be transmitted. If we look at the uh, laws of conservation, we know that light cannot disappear, energy cannot disappear, it will merely change its form. So in this case, we will have that the incident is equals to the reflected, the absorbed or the transmitted. It is only the transmitted part we can use for something uh, in an application. And once we have transmitted it, at the end it has been in interaction with the process, we'll now have to reverse that because the light will have to travel uh, back again. So let's look at a few of the losses that will happen. They are either uh, lost by reflection on the entrance, absorption in the fiber, then further on light will be absorbed by the sample, but we're not going to look into that. Let's look at the reflection loss. The reflection reflection loss at the entrance can be estimated by this formula. And if we calculate it, we can see that roughly 3.2% of the light will never enter the fiber. That all assumes that we're using the right angles and stuff. If we come very shallow angled, all of the light will uh, be reflected, but that's next slide. So now we know some of the light will not but roughly 97% of the light enters the fiber, but now it will be absorbed along the road. Not all wavelength will travel at the same easiness. One of the next things we're going to look into, which will be uh, one of the specifications of a fiber, is the numerical aperture. Let's call it a mathematical opening angle. Let's call it how steep can we get the light into the fiber. 
a fiber will quite often have something called an Na and a normal fiber in the near infrared will be Na.22. That looks like Chinese, but it's actually quite simple. The Na is the sign of the acceptance angle and it follows this formula. This means we can calculate that we will have to come at an angle of 25.4 top angle to get the light into the fiber. So we can't use very fast optics, not very steep angles, and our focal point will have to be some distances away. That's to get the light in. So now we know how the fiber is, is produced and we know how to get it in there. The next thing is how does it stay there? Well, here we rely on a physical concept called the critical angle or Brewster angle. If light hits the boundary between two refractive indexes, it will bounce off. Think of air and water, the sun coming down and we see the beautiful sunset. That's a good example of very uh, grazing angle reflected light. If light is uh, hits the boundary at a given angle higher than the uh, critical angle, some light will be reflected, but some light will be transmitted. If we lower the angle, a lower portion will be transmitted. Most of it will be reflected, but only when we get to the critical angle, all of the light will skip off the surface and stay in the fiber. So it's all about staying uh, shallow with the angles which also gives some limitations to how much bending can we accept in a fiber uh, for various reasons. So critical angle means totally uh, total internal reflectance. For some of you may have uh, seen this physics applied to mid-infrared ATR crystals as well. It's the same physics. Now that light is in the fiber, it will not transmit equally well at all wavelengths. Let's look at this absorption curve. That's for a normal fiber. We see that we have high absorption, as can be read from the y-axis in the slightly odd uh, uh, thing called decibels per kilometer. Not a very commonly used thing, but I will explain it later. We see that in the range from uh, in the mid-range from 1,000 to 1,600 nanometers, 10,000 to um, 5,000 wave numbers, it's very easy to get light through a fiber. But we also see that if we approach the UV or if we approach the mid-infrared, it gets very, very uh, difficult. Hence, we see that we have in the hundreds or the thousands of decimals per kilometer in absorption. One little overlooked detail is the OH um, band we have in the middle. The OH peak here is for um, comes stems from simply OH groups embedded in the glass during the um, POD process or uh, when it was heated and drawn. A good quality fiber will have a OH value of less than 15 ppm, but even 15 ppm, if we look at um, the absorption law E minus alpha LC, we'd see that, okay, concentration may be low, but if we run for hundreds of meters, we still get a signature from this, uh, from, from this OH group uh, region. And it's generally an area we may want to avoid using fiber optics. This region is temperature sensitive as well. That goes for all fibers. But we learned here, we want to have as low OH as possible and 15 ppm is round the practical limitation. So how does this uh, convert to a real practical application? Well, we all know that in the near infrared, we have what's called the combination region from 1800 to 2500 nanometers or from 4000 to 5000 wave numbers. If we look at the graph at a classical uh, region, of 2350 or roughly 4200 something uh, wave numbers, we see that we can look into this graph and see that we have an attenuation of light of a thousand decimals per kilometer. That converts to one decibel per meter, which again translates to three decimals per three meters. 
three decibels means that we have a reduction of 50% of light, half the energy comes through per three meters. This means that at one meter we have 90% of the light coming through, but it also means that when we go above 25, we have total blockage. So if we rely on this region, and it's very, very important for us to have that, that may be difficult to apply for online uh, spectroscopy. We'll simply have to test at line whether we can do with an overtone or a combination band with slightly more transportable wavelength. So this is how this all works. We cannot transport all wavelength at the same easiness. That was a bit about fiber optics, and we have been around how they are constructed, how the ratio between the core and the cladding tells us what kind of a fiber. In this case, we looked at step index fibers. We looked at how light is uh, transmitted in a fiber. We see how it worked with internal reflection, and that should give us a few of the tricks of the trade for using a fiber optics in applied spectroscopy. And I hope you enjoyed that. Watch some of our other videos on relevant topics for industrial spectroscopy. And remember, awesome spectroscopy rocks. Thank you.